Hello everyone. Welcome to the first of a short series of tutorials for some of the basics of playing Cepheus Protocol. I'll be taking you through some of what you'll need to know as you begin your mission to stop the virus. Be aware that at the time of making this, I'm playing on patch 1.3 and many of the features I discuss may have had major changes, so please keep that in mind as you follow along. First things first, we'll take a look at the UI. Starting in the top left, we have the Newscaster, which will relay important information to you from throughout the map, such as when the infection spreads to a new area, or reports on what civilians might be doing. When a news broadcast comes in, you will hear this sound. And you can click on the alert itself to move the screen to the location of the report. If you wish, you can mute the alert sound with the speaker button, or view previous news alerts in the drop-down menu underneath. However, watch out for these, as news reports are often vague and not always accurate, so be careful with how you respond to them. Underneath the newscaster is the group shortcut menu, which can provide a quick overview of your forces and the squads you've assigned them to. Underneath that, we also have an Idle Engineer button, which can be used to quickly find any of your builders who are currently not doing anything. Moving down further, we have the Submenu Radial, which contains the Pause menu, with everything you'd expect from that. A list of active operators, which are powerful player-controlled units you can play directly in third person. A Night Vision toggle, The ROE and visual toggle menus, which allow you to customize how you want your forces to engage the infected, along with various visual toggles and options that you can customize to show or hide additional visual feedback. A diplomacy menu, which you can use to interact with the various human factions that will begin to appear over time. An objective list toggle, And finally, the Doctrines menu, where players can use the experience they've earned fighting the infected in order to unlock more advanced or specialized units, structures, and abilities. Then at the bottom left of the screen, you'll find the minimap, which can be expanded and if need be toggled to show more or less depending on your preferences. Moving to the top right side of the screen, first up we have a timer, which shows how long before your next aircraft arrives to deliver troops and vehicles to drop zones. Second and third, a day counter to keep track of how many days since the infection began, and a clock which allows you to time your plans and assaults properly. Be careful beginning any kind of attacks at night, as the infected will be more active and your units will have a harder time seeing. Fourth, an overview of the civilian population, showing how many civilians are on the map, how many have been fully turned into infected monsters, how many have been killed, and how many have been evacuated to safety. Fifth, a summary of your total cash available, which will also show how much you're making per supply drop and when the next supply drop is due. Sixth, a summary of total DNA acquired, which can be used to research shredder rounds, which are required to defeat patient zero and win the game. Seventh, a population counter, which shows you how many units you have on the field, as well as your total capacity. And lastly, a slow motion toggle button, which can be used when you require a little extra time in order to make decisions or respond to surprises. Moving down, we have the ability menu, which contains various abilities, which can be used to various effects, such as ammo drops for units low on ammo, airstrikes to clear areas of infected, and multitudes of other options. And in the bottom right corner we have the control locks, which we'll explore more in the next part. It's used to give various orders such as attack moves, unit abilities, or even toggling headlights for vehicles. Now moving on to basic controls. You can select units by left-clicking them. To select multiple units, hold left-click and drag a box over them. And finally, if you wish to add additional units to your selection, hold the shift key when selecting control. units, and they'll be added to your current your selection orders? without losing your previously held units. With your units selected, you can give a move order Moving using right-click. 
Units will take the shortest path in order to reach their done. destination, but there are various options to change the behavior as they move. For example, holding shift while right clicking will queue up multiple move orders, allowing you to choose a specific route your units will take to reach a location. It will be done. What are your orders? I'm ready. You can also decide which direction you want units to face by holding right click and moving the cursor in the direction you desire. I'm ready. Now let's focus on the control box and the various options it gives you. This will vary slightly depending on the unit, but this should give you a good idea. There's an attack move, which will make units stop to engage any hostile forces along control. the way while moving. A speed toggle between walking and running. It's time to act. I've got this under control. It will be done. A simple hold command, which will cancel all current orders and tell the unit control. to remain in place. Stopping. A patrol order, which allows you to tell units to follow a route in a loop in order to keep an eye on areas with fewer units. And a formations menu, which is used to set the formation of your currently selected units. Different formations are useful for different situations, so be sure to experiment to find out which ones work best for you. Next up, we come to the utility portion of the control box. These options vary depending on unit, but you'll find Neither. things such as a switch weapon command, a reload toggle, uh, the fire mode toggle. This is very useful and allows you to switch between modes such as normal, which will fire at all hostile targets, safe, which will prevent your units from firing, even if they're under attack, Units, which will allow them to fire at all enemy targets except structures. And finally, Special, which will restrict firing to special enemies such as spitters, juggernauts, or leviathans. After that, we have a flashlight toggle, or headlights in case of vehicles, which allows your units to see further at night. And in the case of this unit, a suppressor toggle, which doesn't apply to all weapons, Clipping but silencer. it will greatly decrease the noise your units make when firing, which is really useful in stealth situations. And on the final bar is usually our more unit-specific abilities, such as in the case of the Rifleman, a grenade... Ready to go. ...field construction menu and a flare launcher. Uh, most infantry units also have the ability to fire into the air, which will scare away any civilians from an area in case you need to clear it quick. For the last section of this video, we'll talk about construction. Let's switch over to this basic CERC outpost and take a look. Some units are capable of basic construction, such as this rifleman who can deploy sandbags and barbed wire. While simple, these can be really useful to deploy when you don't have much time or any engineers around to construct something more complex. Speaking of engineers, let's take a look at them. Engineers are responsible for, for most of CERC's buildings and defenses, capable of constructing not just base buildings, but powerful walls, towers, and even more complex or decorative field defenses, such as concrete barriers and signs. To start with, let's build a vehicle depot by this hangar. You'll notice almost all of CERC's main structures are deployed via airlift, which allows you to quickly set up bases in almost any area. I've got you, sir. Now, once the building's deployed, you'll notice it does not function because it has no power. Many buildings and defenses require power and will not function without. In order to get power, you'll have to construct generators and connect power to structures. This base already has a generator, so instead of wasting money on a new one, we're going to build a power pylon and just simply connect power across the base. When building generators and power pylons, you'll see a radius around, which shows just how far it can connect power to. Anything within that circle will be connected to your power grid. Just be careful. If one of your power pylons goes down, it may lead to parts of your base or defenses without power, which can be disastrous. Alright, that's all for the first part of this tutorial series, which I hope has taught you some of the basics. If you still want to learn more, I'm working on a part 2 where we'll start a basic match on default settings, and I'll go into some more depth about the fundamentals of playing a pandemic campaign as the CERC. 
Thank you all so much for watching, and I hope you've enjoyed.